Hey, Tom. Hey, how's it going? Lunch can't come quick enough, right? Tell me about it. Whoa, whoa, what do you got there? Um, look, I want to say it's some sort of meat on wholemeal, but I'm not entirely sure. Ah, oh, the old mystery meat on brown, eh? Yeah. You seem to get that a lot. Yeah, I know. Did you want to trade? I don't know. Let me have a look. Oh. <laughs> what did you get? Well, if I'm being accurate, I'd probably say it's some kind of a, a frozen, aerated foam of saturated dairy fats with a sort of a Theobroma cacao infusion. It, it's sort of sitting on a slightly cooked, coiled wafer. Right. So, did you want to trade? Um, you know what, on second thoughts, I think I'll stick with mine. At least I know what mine is. <laughs> Suit yourself. It's a chocolate ice cream. Hey, well, that's what I said. With a cherry on top. I forgot to mention that. No, you didn't. You said... Well, I can't remember exactly what you said. It was all very confusing. But you didn't say you had chocolate ice cream. Yeah. How, how does it even fit in your lunchbox? How does it not melt? Yeah, it's a bit of a mystery, isn't it? <laughs> Much like the meat on your sandwich, to be honest. Anyhow, enjoy. Mm. I would have tried your fellas, yeah? This is good. Today on Scope, we're opening our recipe book to find some tasty science concoctions. We'll take a slice of a cake that's oozing chemical reactions, churn our way through cheese making, and look how salt can electrify more than just our food. Excuse me. Ah, hello diners. Uh, my name is Rob. I'll be your waiter today. And on today's menu, it's very exciting. We've got a touch of salty science. That's one of our specials. Uh, uh, there's a dish that comes with a side serve of cheese. Actually, there's two dishes of that nature. There's a little science sprinkled in there as well. And of course, our dessert. It's a chocolate dish with a double dose of, you guessed it, science. Why, you might ask? Because today we're trying to give you just a taste of science. And perhaps I could start you off with a little bit of trials. Enjoy. From microbiology and preservation to physics and safety, science and food have shared a very strong partnership. But it's fast moving out of the lab and into the kitchens, with the culinary world embracing something called molecular gastronomy. Using this science-inspired cooking, more chefs are discovering ways of combining chemical and physical reactions to come up with new dishes. <clears throat> and now for your dining experience today, I thought we'd skip over entree, and perhaps even bypass the main course, and head straight to the sweet stuff for a double dose of a chef who, uh, well, takes molecular gastronomy to a whole new level. Hey guys, I'm Darren Purchase, and today we're going to head into the kitchen and cook up a storm. Let's go. Yep and we're going to be making one of my famous explosive raspberry cakes and we'll be sure to mix in a whole lot of science. Okay, Scopers, first up, we're going to make my chocolate aerated shortbread. For this, we're going to beat a few egg yolks with some sugar until it's pale and frothy. Then we're going to sift together plain flour, cocoa powder and baking powder Add some softened butter and a pinch of salt to the egg yolks and then fold this into the flour. And finally, we're going to roll out our shortbread between two sheets of baking paper to about one centimetre in thickness. Chill it for a few minutes, then cut out a 15 centimetre disc and bake in an oven. And this is where some of that science comes in. You see, the aerated shortbread has baking powder and this contains carbon dioxide. When added to the dough, it expands and creates a light and fluffy texture. Okay, while that's cooking, let's go and get started on the raspberry cream. For this, we need raspberry puree, egg yolks, caster sugar, gelatine leaves, and unsalted butter. Now these are gelatine leaves. We use these to make jelly. But first up, we need to soften them in ice cold water. 
Time for more eggs, more sugar, and more whisking. Then we can mix that into the raspberry puree and cook until 82 degrees Celsius. To do this, we're gonna use our Swish new batch pasteurizer. Once the puree mixture reaches 82 degrees, we can then add the drained gelatin and the butter, and finally, set into a 15 centimeter cake ring and freeze. Next, we're gonna see some more science in the kitchen as we make our raspberry marshmallow with popping candy. For this, we're going to add water, caster sugar, and dextrose, which is a special type of sugar with a different sweetness, and we're going to heat these three ingredients until they boil. We're going to remove from the heat and add glucose and then return to the heat and cook it to 140 degrees. Now we're gonna add some egg whites to our bowl. We're gonna whisk it to high speed. And we're gonna try and get as much air as possible into these egg whites to give the marshmallow a light and fluffy texture. Once the temperature reaches 140 degrees, we pour the syrup slowly into the egg whites and then whisk on high speed. Next, we melt the gelatine in a hot empty pan and then add that to the mix along with some raspberry powder for flavor. As the gelatine is cooling down, it's making the marshmallow go nice and thick. And finally, we're gonna add some of this popping candy and push it down on top of the shortbread with a frozen disc of raspberry cream. Now, if you want to see how this scientific sweetness turns out, you'll have to pop back later on in the show and you, Dr. Rob, to see the big finale. Mm, that looks like a very delicious two-part degustation course. I can't wait to see how that cake actually turns out. But up next, we churn, or rather turn, our attention to cows and the rather delicious food they produce. There's also a cheesy DIY science. I suggest you order that off the menu. It's up next. Hello and welcome back to Scope, a show that is dedicated to giving you a taste of science. Quite literally, because today you see it's all about food, its flavour and the neat spoonfuls of science that complement it quite perfectly. And up next, well, we've got biology meets chemistry meets the dinner plate. It's from farm to fromage. Oh. What? Too cheesy? <laughs> What do you get when you cross our cow friends, their milk, and a whole lot of science? Ah. Well, if you're thinking cheese, you'd be right. Hi, I'm Chris, and I'm going to show you how a little scientific process will deliver a really tasty result. Mouldy bread is never a good thing. It's full of bacteria and unsafe for you and I to eat. But mouldy cheese, well, that's a whole different story. In fact, cheesemakers like me intentionally create mould to perfect our product. To start this creamy cheese, the first thing we need to do is heat our milk to 36 degrees. Then we need to make our milk acidic by adding special bacteria called starter culture. This culture is full of good bacteria, which feeds off of the milk lactose sugar and causes the bacteria to multiply and create lactic acid. Next up, we add what's known as adjunct mould. And it's this that encourages growth of mould on the outside of the cheese. From here, we add this enzyme, which is called rennet. This coagulates the milk, which means the proteins and fat form a solid curd, while the liquid whey floats to the top. Once the solid curds start to form, we can separate the cheese further by putting it into special moulds to drain the whey overnight. And then it becomes a waiting game where we store the cheese in a temperature and humidity controlled environment and wait for it to mature. Soft cheeses like our white mould cheese need high humidity and will ripen quickly. 
while hard cheeses need slightly lower humidity. This humidity keeps the cheese from getting too dry and allows it to mature at just the right pace. Our cheese will be ready in 10 days, but other cheeses can actually be left for months and even years to mature. During ripening, the adjunct mould we added earlier plays a big part. It encourages the cheese to surface ripen, which means it ages from the outside in. And the end result is a rich and oozy cheese. But why is it we can eat this mouldy food, but we can't eat the mouldy bread we saw earlier? Well, that's because mould can actually come in millions of different types or strains. Some mould, like the kind you find on that old bread, is bad, while others are safe and can even be good for you. In cheese, the moulds we use are safe and don't produce dangerous toxins. For example, there are certain adjunct moulds which are used to make blue cheese. They contain natural antibacterial properties, which are thought to assist with the body's immune system. So there you have it, a healthy dose of dairy goodness. And I'm guessing you're thinking I'm going to finish with a cheesy line. Nope. Waiter, there's mould on my cheese. Well, there's supposed to be on this one. <laughs> Who would have thought that mould in this form could be our taste bud's best friend? Now, if you're a big fan of anything cheesy like I am, uh, the dairy kind as well as the one line kind, you're going to love this DIY science. It's more cheese. Cheese comes in a wide array of shapes, sizes, textures, flavours and styles. But they all have one thing in common. They're all made by separating the water and solids in milk. It seems pretty straightforward, so why don't we try it for ourselves? Hi, I'm Callum. And I'm Themis, and we're going to show you a simple recipe so you can make some cheese for yourself at home. To make this tasty ricotta, you'll need white vinegar, water, full cream milk, and a few bits and pieces from around the kitchen. The first thing we need to do is create a mixture that will make our milk acidic. As you saw, cheese makers use a special bacteria to turn the milk's lactose sugar into lactic acid. But today we're going to use a widely available and edible acid called acetic acid or vinegar. So first up, combine 80 mils of vinegar and 180 mils of water in a small bowl and set it aside. Then with the help of an adult, pour a litre of milk into your saucepan and put it onto the stove on a low heat. Using a wooden spoon, stir the milk as it heats up. Make sure you stir the bottom of the saucepan so the milk doesn't burn. When the milk starts to bubble and boil, quickly remove the pan from the heat. Add the vinegar and water mixture and stir gently, just once or twice. Then leave the saucepan to sit aside for 10 minutes. During that time, the vinegar makes the milk's proteins and fat clump together. This forms solid curds, while the remaining mixture becomes a liquid whey. So why can milk be separated in this way? Well, it's because it's a colloid. But what's that? A colloid is a mixture of substances that do not settle over time. Milk is an example of a colloid because the protein molecules just float around without clumping or settling. This is also one of the reasons milk looks white. But when we curdle the milk by making it more acidic, this causes the proteins to stick together, settle out and create curds. Now it's time to properly separate the two. Line a sieve or colander with two layers of paper towel and place it over a large bowl. Bring the saucepan next to the sieve and use a slotted spoon to transfer the curds onto the paper towel. This allows us to catch the curds while the whey drains into the bowl. Now for our favourite part, the taste test. Ricotta is great on crusty bread with olive oil, lemon juice, balsamic vinegar or salt and pepper. Or it can even be used to make a delicious dessert by adding some fruit and honey. This ricotta can then be stored in the fridge in an airtight container for up to four days. So there you have it. Science at home has never tasted so good. Coming up on Scope, our journey continues through the menu that is a taste of science. From salt-generated electricity to the finale of Darren's molecular gastronomy goodness. Well, stay tuned because I'd hate to have to have your share. Oh, <laughs> oh.
Hello, you are back on Scope. I am your waiter, Rob, and I hope you've got just a little bit of room left after the feast of science that has been on the show today. It has, of course, been a taste of science, and, well, things are about to get a little bit salty. Or a lot salty, if you have a pile of it this big. This is sodium chloride to a scientist, or table salt to most people. Here, the salt is being produced by evaporating seawater, but believe it or not, it can also be mined. It's been used since ancient times to preserve food and as such was considered pretty valuable by many civilizations. Of course, we still use salt today to cook and preserve food, but two thirds of the annual salt production actually goes to industry. And now there might be another use. Hi, I'm Frank and I'm researching the possibility of one day using salt to store heating and cooling for your home. But how? Well, to answer that, we need to take a closer look at this chemical compound. We like to call it a phase change material. That's because it can be used to store hot or cold energy when it changes from a solid to a liquid or vice versa. It's able to do this because when salt is melted, it absorbs heat, which means it's able to store it too. When it's frozen, it releases heat, so that's when it can store cool energy. Our phase change energy storage technology currently takes advantage of this by using salt to keep things cool. Our technology uses electricity to freeze salt and store cool energy inside a storage tank. When that stored energy is needed, the cold is then released by melting the salt. So how does this work exactly? Well, it has a lot to do with these coils, which are arranged in a special way. We use electricity to cool a special solution, which is then passed through our coils to freeze the salt. When we want to melt the salt, the same solution, which is now warm, is passed through our coils again. This cooling option is great because for one thing, it can help cut down the electricity bill. The tank is also pretty small for the cooling it can store, and this cooling can be released quickly. We wanted to test this out in the real world, so we created a full-scale version of it at a farm. This system has been able to store cheap electricity from the grid overnight, and then use that to power the farm's cool rooms during the day. So far, it's been pretty successful. And one of the main reasons for this is that it uses salts that can store cooling at minus 11 degrees Celsius. These salts are great because they keep the cool rooms at a perfect temperature of anywhere between minus two to four degrees Celsius. We're now working on developing similar storage systems which can provide cold as well as hot energy. That includes making tanks which could one day help provide cool air or warm water to your home. So with a little bit of salt, we're making energy a lot more sustainable and affordable for the future. Earlier on this smorgasbord of science, we took you on a journey through a very sciencey kitchen to see the preparation of an explosive raspberry cake. So very scope. Now it's sad if you missed that, but not because it isn't finished yet. Welcome back to the Birch and Purchase Kitchen, where today we'll be looking at some of the science involved in making one of my famous explosive raspberry cakes. With our aerated chocolate shortbread, beautiful raspberry cream, and of course, our raspberry marshmallow with popping candy already made, it's time to move on to the raspberry jelly. For this, we'll need raspberry puree, some sugar syrup, our gelatine leaves, and this, we need a tiny amount of agar, which is a type of seaweed, and it makes jellies. Now, it's really important to weigh out ingredients correctly. And when you're using only a tiny amount of ingredients, like this agar, you need to use scales that weigh just a point of a gram. For this recipe, we need 2.25 grams. To make the jelly, all we need to do is place the agar, sugar syrup and puree to the pan, give it a stir and then heat. Next, we add the soaked gelatin. Give it a stir. And that's our jelly made and ready. We're just going to finish off the layers on this cake by just pouring the jelly on top and watching it set. And 
And with some of this leftover jelly, we'll pour it into these fancy silicone molds and use these for decoration later on. Okay, now in they go. And while they're setting, we can go and make our delicious milk chocolate mousse. For this, we're going to add cream, milk, and some trimaline, which is a type of inverted sugar, and the seeds from one vanilla pod. Then we'll heat this to 80 degrees. We're going to add our egg yolks and recook to 85 degrees. Now, what we're doing is making a custard. We've added the egg yolks to the hot milk, and we're going to bring this up to a temperature of 85 degrees, which is going to cook the eggs and make them safe, but also give the custard a nice thickness so our mousse has got a great texture. Finally, we're going to add the soaked gelatine and the chocolate and blitz well to emulsify. Then we're going to pour the mixture into a bowl, fold in the whipped cream little by little until we have a shiny cream. And what we're going to do now is assemble the cake. Right, and we've got two more components left to finish this explosive raspberry cake. And I reckon they're the most fun parts of all. First up, the dark chocolate spray. For this, all we need to do is mix some melted cocoa butter into some melted dark chocolate before pouring into our special spray gun. Now, how cool is this? Spraying liquid chocolate onto a cake. You see, when you spray onto a cold or frozen cake, the liquid chocolate reverts back to solid and congeals on the cake, leaving a velvet textured finish. We use the cocoa butter to help thin out the chocolate spray mix, otherwise melted chocolate is too thick for our gun. Now for our final component today, nitro crushed raspberries. We're just gonna pour some raspberries into a bowl and pour liquid nitrogen over the top. The liquid nitrogen is around minus 196 degrees Celsius. And it's great to have in the kitchen because it's extreme temperature can help snap freeze ingredients in a matter of seconds. And once the raspberries are frozen, we can smash them up into small pieces to put onto our cake. The great thing about the liquid nitrogen is we're not gonna harm any of the enzymes in the raspberries. We can just smash them into individual filaments. There you have it, one amazing explosive raspberry cake made using a whole stack of kitchen science. Now for me, there's no better recipe for tasty science than this. <sighs> what a way to start and end our journey through a taste of science. I, for one, will be able to dine out on that for quite some time. But if you were <laughs> late to the table, here's some of what you missed. There was the cheesy science that showed us how mould can actually play an important part in food creation. The salt being used to power our worlds. And of course, Darren's dessert double that had us overeating our molecular gastronomy. If you skipped any of those meals, then check out our website and don't forget to make a reservation next time when the ordinary ahem, becomes extraordinary. Under the scope. Oh dear. <laughs>